Hello and welcome to the second episode of my Bevy Game Jam 3 series where I show you the progress that I'm making on my game. So making an episode every day that I made progress sort of went out the window, mostly because like the first three days were almost complete wash with not being able to get anything done. The fourth day I actually got nothing done. And then once I started getting things done, um, I was in such a panic that I didn't have time and it was the house was so noisy that I didn't uh, have the like ability to just sit down and record a five minute video that we're like on the last day of the jam and I'm making the second part and I have just like an absolute shitload to cover. So I'll start right back at the beginning on the few days that were almost a wash but not quite. So on the second day, I basically just made some meshes to, for a little basic palm tree. You know, so I made a frond and a coconut and the actual stem of the tree. And then I made um, like a little sprout version. So when the seed's in the ground, I then programmed that up later to grow. I also did some pallet adding to my wave crate, but that never actually ended up getting used. The idea would be that depending on what pot you planted the plant in might have its color change but that didn't end up working so I just moved on that's now in my crate if anyone's using the wave collapse crate it just lets you shift the uv colors around on day five I actually got some shit done the main thing that I did was add the palm tree and it would now grow over time this was also the day I added a hot bar so just so that you could have like an inventory tab at the bottom that would allow you to hold things on day six i then added a tab bar and a toolbar so that you could select between uh, five different tools depending on what interaction you wanted to do with the plants so you've got like, the shears for gathering leaves your hands for picking up fruit uh your shovel for digging up roots an axe for cutting trees down uh, and on the other side you've got the tabs the menu tab which just takes you back to the main menu so you can edit settings the world tab, which takes you to the primary world. The shop tab, which would give you sort of like a little story beat about who is uh, visiting you and what potion they want you to create. Uh, this also specifies what effects and whatnot. Uh, then you've got your inventory tab, which is just like 100 slots for storing items off your hotbar that you may want later. So the way the game currently works is you can actually add potions as ingredients for potions. And that will more or less just instantly give you that effect. So if you want to duplicate potions, you just chuck a potion in and then make copies of it. Uh, you can also sort of modify a potion that you already have by chucking it in and then adding other ingredients to make additional effects. If you can work out how to do that with the math, you'll, that'll make more sense when I explain my crafting system. Uh, and then also there's the crafting tab, which lets you type in commands like process and then what process to apply to an ingredient and it'll then modify that ingredient to have that process and then there is also the brew which is this the potion equivalent so you can like taste your brew to find out what effects it has you, you can add an ingredient to your brew you can empty your brew out or you can make a potion out of the brew and there's no limit to how many potions you can make out of a brew you can just keep taking potions same as there's no limit to how many ingredients you can add to a brew the only real limitation is if you end up setting all eight bits of a potion it becomes a potion of instant death and it's basically a wash so you can't just chuck everything in and the other thing is there's no way to unset bits the potion will always have those bits as if the if a chemical is in your brew it's always in there so so that's the tabs i added on day six now on to as i've written in my notes day who even knows anymore because at this point i don't actually know what i did on what day because i was in such a rush to get things done because i thought i was running out of time that i've just started doing things and like I don't even have git commits for half these ads they're just you know at the end I've got like yes committing just so that I could change something that I knew you know may I want to undo so there's only a few git commits if you're following along in the github for this <laughs> section it, it got really out of control so first off let's cover crafting so the way crafting works is that you'll have items that you get from the world and they will specify a plant and a plant part and depending on what plant and what plant part specifies what bits they will set when used as an ingredient then when you turn them into an ingredient you can apply a whole bunch of operations to them such as burning them freezing them uh, chopping them up blending them uh, all these things just apply sort of bitwise operations to the ingredients eight bits that it has so spinning them to the left will rotate the bit at least one and up to four or until a one hits the leftmost edge and spinning them to the right does the same thing, but to the right. And there's a whole bunch of these operations that you can do. 
I kept adding operations and like dif different bitwise manipulations until my little test suite that I was using told me that it's possible to achieve every single number. So every 8-bit number can be achieved using the base ingredients that I currently have in the game and these operations in less than three steps. So it's, I don't know how many times, how many ingredients you have to add, but you'll never have to manipulate a single ingredient more than three times in order to get every single possible number. So that's the, that's the basics of the crafting system. The other thing about the crafting system is when you consider a potion to be done, I use a bunch of manipulations to the 8-bit result that is in the cauldron to determine what potion effects. So things like if all 8 bits are set, it's a potion of instant death. If no bits are set, it's just water because you literally haven't added anything. If exactly the integer value 20 is achieved, that means you've got a saturation potion because the only way to achieve that, or I guess the easiest way to achieve that, is to just put fruit into the cauldron and nothing else. So you've just made soup. Then there's things like if there's six or more bits, you've got a paralysis potion, just because I was going with the approach, the more bits, the more negative. You'll also see that if you have five consecutive bits, you've got a nausea potion. Then there's things like if every odd bit is set, then it's a regeneration potion. If every even bit is set, then it's a poison potion, since they're just the reciprocals of each other. It's poison or it's regeneration. Uh, there's things like luck is if it's modulo of a very specific number, it's lucky. If you miss that number by one, so one below or one above, then it's a bad luck potion. Then there's also things like the fire and ice sets of potions. This works by counting the number of ones in the top nibble and the number of ones in the bottom nibble, and then working out what potion it is based on the difference. So if you have four in the top nibble and zero in the bottom nibble, it's a blizzard. If you have zero in the top nibble and four in the bottom nibble, it's an explosion since it's sort of the opposite, it's fire. And then there's um, just sort of like different levels. So if there's a difference of three, it's an ice storm. If there's a difference of two, uh, it's a snowball, you know, and the, and the fire counterparts to that. And then I've got, if there's a difference of one and, and at least an intensity of two on both, there's sort of like a fire frost and an inferno blizzard, uh, sort of like the two at the same step sort of thing. So they're both present, but they're close enough that they sort of combine as opposed to cancel out. But that was just sort of an interesting thing. And then there's a whole bunch of other things like bitwise operations that determine whether a potion is present. And so the idea is you've just got to kind of work out how you are going to get that. There's also tool tips that will tell you like what you need in order to get the blizzard. So when you go to the shop and he's like, hey, I want a blizzard potion, it will tell you it's four ones in the top nibble and zero in the bottom nibble. Uh, and it'll say like paralysis. So the actual potion effect recipes can be found in the tool tips of the potion effects. Each potion effect also gets a sequence of tags. This is used for when I create potion requests i will say pick a random potion effect then remove any uh exclusionary potions these are things like uh luck and bad luck it's impossible to get both in the same potion so it'd be really annoying if it said hey i want a luck and bad luck potion it's impossible to get the two uh the same as all of the fire and ice potions are not even just counter like you can't have a fire and ice potion because they actually check in the same logic which one you get that's exclusive uh and then there's also things like the saturation potion if you make a saturation potion there is literally no other side effects you can have because saturation potion is very specific about what value it needs so these all result in like exclusionary things where you can't get us to make potions that are not possible to be made together can't guarantee that this is actually true since it's just sort of the ones I've worked out to not be possible. So there may still possibly be some that are impossible. So do, uh, do let me know if you find any combinations that you think are impossible. And the way potion tags are used in the actual potion crafting system is I basically say, when I create a potion, there's the main effect that you're trying to get. And then it'll pick either another effect you need to have, which is where the exclusionary comes in. It's, you can't have two conflicting effects. An additional effect you can't have which also is excluded for the point of there's no point saying, hey, I want a luck potion that doesn't have bad luck. So those two exclude each other. And then there's a, I want a tag. So you might get a, a request that says like, hey, I want a paralysis potion that has an error of effect. So what you would need to do is make a potion of paralysis with another effect that has the tag error of effect. So like chucking a fireball or a snowball into a potion of paralysis will make it a potion of paralysis with a tag error of effect. Uh, I also remove the tags as potential options 
if the main effect has that tag. So you'll never get a potion that says, hey, I need a potion of this with this tag where the tag is already present on the main potion. There's also the counterpart of this of a potion without a tag. So it will say, hey, I need this effect and none of the other effects can give the potion this overall effect. This is done just by simply going through the list of remaining potion effects and making sure that none of their tags share uh, overlap with the conflicting tag and then that allows it to work. It only tries five times to find one, otherwise it just returns and says, no, there's no secondary restriction. When a customer comes in and orders a potion, they are assigned a archetype. So, you know, adventurer, witch, wizard, alchemist, noble, and a mood. So they can be like happy, angry, anxious, excited. And based on this, I got ChatGPT to generate me a like collection of responses that the person will order a potion. So a happy adventurer will say, hello, so I would like a potion of this or that and then i also have an extra version of this where it comes in and it goes hey if an adventurer wants an extra effect they'll say like i also need this additional effect whereas if a witch comes in and asks for an extra effect they'll say i must have this extra effect or it's a no-go so there's different responses that they will give when generating their requests based on their personality and their archetype I also did things like you can now plant seeds. So if you pick a coconut before it's fully ripe, you can now plant it to grow an additional tree. This is allow this is to allow you to cut down trees to get the wood and the bark to then add to extra potions. There's also, as I've been mentioning, a tooltip system that makes it so if you hover over an item for half a second or longer, it'll pop up explaining what that item is and also the uh, binary representation of that item so if you would add it as an ingredient or apply an effect to it what bits would be set and so you can then work out from there what values you want to do i used chat gpt towards the end again because i felt like i was running out of time to do a lot of the uh, heavy lifting when it came to like descriptions and things so all of the talking responses are all chat gpt generated a lot of the potion effects were expanded upon by like asking chat P gpt to give me like three tiers of fire potion and you know three tiers of ice potion and that's actually why i have the combination of potions is because chat gpt returned a whole bunch of like ember frost and i was like all right i'm gonna make combination potions where it's like it's a fire and ice potion uh chat gpt also did all the tagging because it's like i just asked it to generate some tags and then i asked it to apply those tags to the potion list um, ChatGPT is an incredible tool for this kind of thing because it on its own probably couldn't write very good code. Like it seems to not understand. Like I had to put it, sometimes put it into the IDE to get it to correct where ChatGPT is just doing things that aren't allowed. But for the sake of like creative writing aspects of things where I can say, hey, you know, match wizard, match mood and be like, hey, fill these in. It does an incredible job of like generating it. There was, you know, some kind of things where, like, it would specify a specific potion rather than a, um, you know, fill-in gap uh, indicator. But still, it was pretty impressive that it could generate, like, lots of somewhat uniquely sounding. Some of the, the responses are duplicated. I feel like this might have been because of how I was approaching giving it um, answers. Instead of saying, generate them all at once, I was going, like, do me the adventurer, do me the witch, do me the wizard, and saying, don't make it like the others, which meant that um, it didn't necessarily comprehend that it had already written the others previously. It's basically all I've done for the game. It's in somewhat of a functional state. I'm going to spend the rest of the time, which at the time of recording this is about 11 hours left before the, the game has to be submitted, just sort of polishing things up, putting uh, better sprites in, making sure that there's no um, obvious errors or crashes, and hopefully you'll be able to play my game uh, shortly after this video goes live. So thank you all for watching.